week four already. Um, we are going to start journeying into some uh, proverbial high weeds. Um, I do love uh, this book. I mean, when you start getting in and seeing some of the things, uh, you know, Peter talked in Second Peter chapter three about just Paul's writings. He's like, listen, that dude, he. I'm paraphrasing. He's like, that dude, that dude, he writes, yeah, this is the uh, Lou International uh, version, but he says, you know what, Paul writes some stuff, and man, it's just hard. It's just, I can't even get my head around it type of deal. And so that's where God leaves us is, you know, this book is literally as deep of a rabbit hole as, as you could ever imagine, because, and, and it's unsearchable, right? You know, Dave even talks about you know, the unsearchable riches and this kind of stuff because there's just no way within our humanness that we could ever grasp the whole understanding of of who God is and how he thinks you know we know verses that talk about you know my ways are not your ways and so tonight you're going to be you know challenged with the idea of you know having grown up and some of you that are uh of maybe closer to my generation and sat through the uh uh, the flannel boards, right? The black flannel boards and the sticky yeah. things. And you were just handed down some uh, general concepts about uh, creation and how this universe works. And we've just uh, uh, accepted um, things that NASA says, trust us, we're astrophysicists, this is how it works. Uh, but it doesn't line up with the Bible, right? Um, that is not a precursor to anything uh, flat earth. I would not be of that mindset. Uh, but there are some things in the Bible that talk about, you know, there being bodies obviously large quantities of water frozen both above the firmament and below the firmament and the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars sit in between that and so when you draw a picture of what that looks like it's like i remember nasa talking about that nasa don't because nasa don't know how to get their head around right but again you know god says hey let uh, god be true and every man a liar and if god says that there's frozen water above and frozen water above i'm rolling with that and so uh like i said we could spend, we're, we're, I mean, we're not going to be three, four sentences into the very start of a Bible, and we're going to have just the most head-spinning, potentially, thought process uh, that you might have been presented with. Some of you guys may have been uh, propositioned by this, and these aren't, I, they're, they're not crazy, really winged out theological concepts. Mm -hmm. So these are things that people have debated for hundreds of years type video so this isn't a concept that you know some you know hippie came up with in the 60s and i just thought well, that's cool we should teach that right this ain't that right this is stuff that has biblical background biblical truth that really when you land on either side um there's enough reason to go down and support uh the angle i'm going to present to you tonight with some of the things within creation as much as the traditional thoughts of how you've approached it and so we we keep saying it over and over again just do the berea thing Go search the scriptures, pray to God, and have him tell you, based off the verses that are presented in this book, have I actually been taught the full counsel, or was I simply taught the things that a guy himself, that's all he could get his head around? And that's a lot of times the case um, when we find ourselves in some churches or even in some life groups that, you know, they can only take you as far as they've ever gone. And so if you have something that's a little deeper into the word, if they've not been down that road, you know, it's going to be hard for them to communicate some of these uh, potential truths. And so I don't believe there's what we call like secondary issues. I, I, I think that gives us too much cover as Christians to say, uh, I don't know that I want to address that either way because it just keeps me out of trouble. I think most things as much as with this, with, within us that we need to find out what it says and, and then draw a line based off of our conviction. I don't like kind of landing in the gray. This one, like I said, it, it isn't a, a doctrine that I would you know, die on the hill. You know, there are things that are hill dying type of concepts, you know, soteriological uh, concepts of, you know, we have to have the virgin birth, right? I'm going to argue you six way from Sunday's the necessity. Um, I'm going to argue uh, our salvation is necessitated within the death, burial, and the resurrection, that that was a real and happening event. So those type of things, there are doctrines that, man, you just go to the mat over. This here, like I said, I don't know that we're going to the mat. I, I, I do encourage you to form an opinion, but don't ever let some of these things that are kind of like in the, in the tall weeds 
get you into big debates or heated arguments or things like that because the devil likes to use those things to get you off of uh, task, you know, instead of keeping the main thing, the main thing, you know, uh, we were talking briefly about, you know, just the idea of, you know, I, I like reading and, and studying from the King James Bible, and there are people that have just made it their mission to convert people to that mindset, and they're mad about it, and it's just like, how do you, you know, even have any platform to share with your neighbor the idea of what Christ did for them when you're always arguing with people at church about what Bible they use, right, and so... What I want to do is make sure that we don't ever lose the idea that, uh, you know, God left us with just one thing to do, right? Go ye therefore into all the world, make disciples. And so we always got to make sure that we are coming back to that. And within that, as we're pursuing that, uh, you know, our daily lives should evolve around the concept, is what I'm doing right now or today going to bring the maximum glory to the Lord Jesus Christ? And if I'm not pursuing Matthew 28 and letting my life exhibit something that will glorify God, then I'm probably spending too much time in those other areas. So um, like we've mentioned in other classes, you know, this is going to be um, great informational type stuff for you to consider. Um, ideally, it's to encourage you to get into this book, search these things out, and let this book do a transformation within your life so that you can uh, excitedly come here and say, I had no idea that the Bible taught about so many things. There's like, when you go into Job, there are so many scientific things that they've just found out in the last hundred years that the book of Job was writing about for 2,000, 2,800, whatever it was. And just like, you know, crazy things. And yet, Job knew about them, right? The three, the three guys that showed up, they knew about them type of deal. And so, those are cool things. So, well, let's go ahead and pray. We'll work you through uh, just a quick uh, recap, and then we'll jump into uh, the questions for today. Lord, again, uh, we just thank, uh, thank you for uh, the time. Uh, we thank you for your body who's willing to get together, Lord, and uh, study your word. And, uh, Father, I just pray that <clears throat> each of us would uh, let our lives daily uh, be a life that exhibits um, surrender <coughs> to your son and to you, and that we would bring you the maximum glory with everything we do and think and say. And so, Father, I just pray that tonight would be yours. Let your spirit uh, define this book in the way that it's meant to be divided. And uh, that it would not be my interpretation or my thoughts or my processes, Lord, but uh, you reveal what you want us to know. And we love you. What you say? Amen. All right. So my reviews have to get quicker because obviously there's more each week. And so I won't even put the verses. I'm just going to remind because every once in a while we get someone who hasn't been here. And so I want to at least give them a sheet where they can go back and confirm this. And so some of the keys of the Bible that we have looked at so far was... One of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing I ask you guys to take away, if nothing else, is you need to get to the point where the Bible is your authority in all matters. It can't kind of guide you. It can't be subjective. It has to be the thing that rules and governs your life. Otherwise, you're going to want to interject your personal bias, and then all of a sudden, you know, you're taking God back off the throne, and you're walking in your own strength. Secondly, God must reveal his word. We talked about the idea that the natural man, according to 1 Corinthians, cannot know this book. Right? The flesh cannot understand it. It's a spiritually discerned book. He tells us to, concern, uh, to look at the Bible, uh, comparing the Bible with the Bible, or the way 1 Corinthians reads is to compare spiritual things with spiritual things. And then you must be willing to study. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And we work through the importance of, uh, you know, there's times to read and just soak up God's word, and then there's other times to, you know, bust out the laptop, grab a commentary, you know, grab a talk, cup of coffee, and uh, and then just go for it and just see where God leads you in the thing that you're studying out. Uh, and then understanding people groups uh, according to God's outline that we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that uh, Paul defines uh, three groups. And so when we go to study this book, it's going to be written to one of three people groups. It's either going to be written in context to the Jews, or it's going to be written in context to the Gentiles. And if you become a saved person who's a part of the church, you were a previous Jew, previous Gentile, but you now are part of the body. So when you get into the New Testament and he talks to the church, which, you know, Romans, Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, but, you know, that kind of stuff, you're going to find doctrine that applies to the church. And so you will have been or are in one of those uh, categories. So, any questions on that? Like I said, I, I know a lot of times you guys hear it next week and it's easy to pass over, but these, if you get these things here, man, you are just going to be 
um, along further down the road with a lot of people that just show up January 1st and go, yeah, 365 days, we'll see, right? You know, right? That's just how it is because they don't have any parameters, you know? It's just like, um, I bought a skid steer from our farm and so, uh, I brought my four-year-old inside the skid steer. And so, I mean, that bucket, eh, we're spinning, right? That, that's what our Bible reading is like if we don't have the handle. So we've got to slow down and say, okay, CJ, this lever, you know, turns it this way. And you don't jerk it, you know, just slowly. And so we're showing them how this uh, is uh, an important tool. It's a powerful tool. But if he's not careful, I mean, he's going to wreck it. He's going to make a wreck out of himself. And so he's now starting, now that he understands, okay, well, with this handle I've got to slow do that it tilts the bucket and if I pull it back it raises the bucket if I do this so he's learning just the sensitivity and the different keys to running the skid steer as a four-year-old I know so some of you might be like wow that's kind of crazy I mean he's not in there by himself I'm, I'm having fun too but, uh, you know so I mean it is a little odd when he says hey let's go knock over a tree and I'm as excited as him um, so we go push over pine trees with it so um, but it's business yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've been teaching my 20 year old son too, and he, he loves being on it. And uh, obviously, I don't have to ride with him. That would be weird if he was sitting on my lap. So, um, <laughs> would be the room. Uh, but yeah, see, so, so this, the Bible's like that. The, you know, the Bible is arguably um, more powerful, you know, in, in what it can do in your life because if you get outside of what it was meant to do and you and apply it or misapply it, you're going to just be off into some crazy doctrines, you're going to be into some uh, crazy, crazy religious activities and just not be uh, centered. And so that's what's going to help us is keeping that in mind. And so then we also talked about this when you get into um, reading a passage is why is this book in the Bible? You know, if I'm reading Jonah, if I'm reading Matthew, um, a lot of study Bibles will tell you why it was written, who was written, that kind of stuff. But go and search out why is uh, this book in the Bible? Uh, what is the book actually teaching? Like when you go to Ephesians, uh, you'll find out that Ephesians really is a book uh, from Paul to the church that is fully revealing the mystery of the church or the mystery of Christ in you. And so when you go to Ephesians, you understand that concept of, okay, Paul's teaching the church at Ephesus. I am part of the church. And if I want to understand the mystery of how it is that Christ exists within me, well, that's some doctrinal stuff that I, I probably need to apply. But now I have a, a context when I'm reading chapter 1 and chapter 2, and when he's making all the statements he has, when I understand the actual book. And then what is that chapter actually teaching? Because when you get into some of the books, you know, it, it breaks down the chapters in which Paul is teaching, you know, if you do this, the reaction to that is that, and so he's working through the chapters in progression. And then what is actually happening, happening when you get to the passage? Because uh, we have a really, really bad habit of going in, grabbing a verse, and going, see, it's what it says. You know, people do this all the time, you know, especially when you have arguments, when people want to talk about uh, things like eternal security, right? And that, you know, you've got to work for it. It's like, what it says right there, you know, those that shall endure to the end shall be saved. Okay, that applies to a group of people. Let's go back and find out who it applies to, because that is a true statement, just doesn't apply to the church, right? And so you got to go to go back into the Bible and find out, okay, well, why does that say that? Because that violates everything Paul has ever taught. He said, I was sealed unto the day of redemption. So what is this verse saying, you know, that I've got to endure till the end? So obviously, something is out of sync. So, you know, we ought to then go and look at what's happening as we get to an individual passage. And then based on the information gathered by those first four questions, what does the verse we're reading actually say? Because again, a lot of times the verse will really mess you up if you don't know the context. And so God's word only has one interpretation. It's his. It's his opinion. It's, it's his thoughts. It's his mind. But the Bible does have three applications. And we're going to talk briefly just about the historical side of this. And so in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right, so it starts at the very beginning that, hey, this is a God-designed, God-breathed, God-inspired thing. We do not get the luxury of stepping in and saying, well, in the original manuscript, it probably should have said X. Well, you know, find a Bible that you can trust and then don't question it because that's, God's never given man the latitude to go and correct him. 
That's always been a recipe for disaster within the Bible when we've let man say, well, what God really meant. No, I'm pretty sure God knows what he meant. And so we, <laughs> we, we need to understand that when, in, when it comes to his opinion, you know, there's only one interpretation. The problem is it, it, we, we understand the interpretation as it's written, but what's the problem as humans that we have with that? Why don't we want to just accept the interpretation as we read it, even though we might understand it? I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, you don't like it. Yeah, why? Because we have to obey it. Yeah. Right. It's just the difference between the one. <laughs> yeah. And so all of a sudden now, you know, you're in my box. That means I've got to maybe, what, do something or stop doing something, right? And we live in a world where it's all about my rights and, you know, you know what's good for me. You know, and, and how I, my liberties, and, and this kind of stuff. In fact, uh, the last of the church periods is the Laodicean church period in Revelation 3. Uh, and it just is easily defined as civil liberties, uh, Laodicean. And we've moved, I mean, I mean I'm only, what am I, 37? <laughs> yeah, with 20 years experience, that's right. Man, you were on tonight, yeah. No, I'm 53, right? Yeah, 53. Yeah, so, um, but, you know, this idea of even coming up as a kid, um, you know, my parents told me what I was to think. I was okay with that, and they would convince me if I had my own thoughts, right, type of deal. But now it's just this idea that um, anything goes, it's a free fall, nothing has a moral compass, never, nothing has a standard. And so when you do that, and everything becomes in, uh, interpretive by what I'm feeling or what I think I know, then we give no room for God to say, no, no, there are standards and so that's why it's so important with that first key that we start with it as our authority because otherwise we're going to ebb and flow like Paul talks about where we're going to become, uh, what's he say, tossed about by what? To and fro with every wind of doctrine, right? Yeah, and so we're going to get caught up in all the cool new stuff that the big flashy pastor on TV is doing. And we're just going to be wooed to sleep with, oh, isn't he cool? With Man, he speaks so good. Well, but yeah, I mean, you know, the devil shows up, you know, as a shining angel. And, uh, you know, he knows the word too. So, and we see that when we get down through here, uh, that the man of God may be perfect. And we talked about this a week or two ago, thoroughly furnished like all good works. And I spent some time looking at this because I, I do know the difference. And I, and I saw it expressed this way, I have told you guys that you know thoroughly is like you know coding something thoroughly, where thoroughly is the idea of getting in you. And so I saw it wrote this way that thoroughly and truly can be thought of as an outside versus an inside starting point. And I said that's exactly how I wanted to say that, even though I couldn't put it into my own words. That when you have that word, and again, even over there they would say that thoroughly is an archaic version of thoroughly. It's a different concept, right? Do I want the word of God upon me, or do I want the word of God like David in Psalm 119? Do I want it to start in me, right? You know, he says, hey, you know, I want to write these things upon my heart. You know, your precepts, your law, I, I devour them, he talks about. They're like honey. And just He's trying to get the word of God. If you go read Psalms 119 and you want to find out how you're to love the word of God, Go read Psalm 119, all 170, whatever verses of that chapter is. It's just Paul or Paul. It's David telling you, this is how I feel about God's word. And you're going to be like, man, this, this guy's kind of like overkill, isn't he? But God looked at him and said, what? And that's a man after my own heart because he loved the word of God as much as he did. So, and then we got to always remember, we haven't touched on this, I've done it in other classes also, is Romans 3, again, Paul writing to the Romans, and it doesn't matter whether you're a Jew, a Gentile, or the church, even though uh, this was written to the church of Rome, uh, we need to live in this truth. God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and might us overcome when thou art judged. So what he's saying is, hey, there's going to be a whole lot of people that look at you and say, hey, you know what? They're going to judge you and say, you know what? That's kind of you know, hurtful the way you <laughs> think, or I don't agree with the way you decipher that Bible. But he said, you know what? If you let God be true and every man a liar, he says, you know what? That we might be justified in what we're standing upon because we're standing upon the, God, the truth of what God has given us. And so he says, you know, you just hold on to the fact that that book is everything that I said it is. And if you land there, they can judge you 
all you want. I'm telling you, you're justified. Stand on that book. And so, even though we have one interpretation, which is God's, we're going to find that you have three applications. And most of the time, you'll find pastors when they teach, um, it's very easy for them to make the historical application because you go back, Sunday school, they're going to, again, put the flannel on the board, we're going to do the boat, we're going to do the animals going onto the ark, we're going to do all those kind of things. And so we're going to be able to wear out the historical side of what uh, is being taught in this book. Uh, the thing that a lot of times they move into, which is easy to do, is okay, now that we've learned the historical application of you know, what uh, Noah was doing, what David was doing, how can I apply that devotionally to me? What can I learn? And so I can go and I go, well, you know what? Noah learned me to, you know, Noah, Noah's story was teaching me how to have faith, even though it might take a hundred years. And so what you're doing is you're taking a historical story, and, and God's book is really just a, a big picture book, right? So what he does, and you see this all, all the time when you, you see the expression, he, um, he'll give a description, he'll say, like this or as that. And so what the whole Old Testament is, is a whole bunch of pictures. And so what he's wanting you to see is, hey, if you can understand that, this is like that when he's teaching in the New Testament. So that's how he uses the Old Testament. And so what happens is we can go into, you know, again, like the case of Noah, and we can say, okay, devotionally, here's a guy that trusted God to do whatever he said, and he started on that mission, and he started working. But at the end of the day, um, he didn't seal himself inside the boat, right? It says that God closed the ark. And so what you do is you have a picture of God taking Noah and his family and placing them in the salvation that was the boat. Again, obviously, that's a natural picture of the New Testament story of how a New Testament believer is taken out of this world, he's put in Christ, and then we're protected from the judgment of this world. And so you get the devotional or inspirational um, picture. But then where a lot of people don't move on to is then the doctrinal or prophetic. And that is the point where, and we talked about this as an example, where you see Abraham and Isaac, right? And so doctrinally we see, or historically, we know you had a guy <laughs> who had a beloved son. They were two people. This happened in history. Um, the devotional thing was he, he trusted to do what God told him to do. He was following the instructions. Uh, but the doctrinal picture of that was this idea that you had a father who sent his son up the hill with wood on his back to be an atonement or a sacrifice, right? And then lo and behold, he, you know, the son says, hey, you know, where's, where's the lamb? And Abraham, in very unique language, says, well, God will provide himself a lamb. And then over in the thicket, there's a lamb caught by the horns with, you know, the thicket around his deal. I mean, obviously, you don't got to think very hard if you go back and read that story and, and see Calvary through the story of that. The parallels are unmissable. And so it's a really, really cool story. And so that is a really good example where we have a historical picture of Abraham and Isaac and guys that were actually doing this event. The devotional, again, would be one of faith and salvation. And then devotionally or doctrinally, it was a picture in the Old Testament that was looking ahead to what would be the New, Te uh, New Testament truth of the Lord Jesus Christ, pictured in all those things that were going on with, again, Isaac going up a hill to be a sacrifice, and then there's an atonement through a lamb, the whole story. So if you've never read that story in light of Calvary, it's a really fun story. It'll just wake that story up for you in a minute, the parallels. Has anyone ever seen that story from that light, the picture of Abraham and Isaac? Yeah, it, it, it's incredible. There's a lot of those in the, in the um, Old Testament. I mean, Isaac was even carrying the wood. Like, That's right. Yeah, he was carrying the wood on his back. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's there's a ton of them. I mean, you can't, there's, it's, it's unmissable. It's, it's, it's a cool story when you read it for that. And so, for, and so, first of all, with everything we read in the Word of God, we must recognize that it actually took place at some point in history. It really happened to real people at a real point in time. With the historical application, we are simply equipping ourselves by becoming completely familiar with, with and believing that the events about which we are reading really happened exactly the way God chose to record them. And what happens is, you know, because then people will always want to raise up the question, well, what do you do with parables, right? God is very clear when he switches into, hey, I'm teaching a lesson here, right, when he gives a story and he moves into the parables, you know, in Matthew and that kind of stuff. Other than that, 
um, you know, you can go and, and read it from a literal presentation. And so, I have to get you guys feedback because, like I said, this was a question that was. Uh, so this may completely blow your hair back and be like, "What? Who? who? I know who asked the question, but, but you guys would be like, "Who's this guy?" All right. So, <laughs> is there evidence in the Bible that there was a pre-Adamic race living on the earth before the creation of man? Uh, and so that's the idea. of Was there anything before? The next question that follows up, and we're not going to get to all this tonight. This is going to flow into next week, but this is going to be a lot of fun. And then, is there evidence of a gap theory? Has anyone ever heard that expression of a gap theory? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so a third of us. Okay. So how many of you have not heard of the gap theory? No clue. Okay. Well, then that's really going to be fun for you guys. Okay. And uh, we may have 10 people next week. Um, and Pastor Matt's calling you tomorrow. <laughs> it's okay, Pastor Matt. I got this off the hippie side. I told you. It's okay. <laughs> And then is there evidence of what was called a Luciferian flood? And so we're going to deal with just the, the first part of this. And so you never probably thought that you'd start with Genesis 1-1, get to Genesis 1-2, and all of a sudden have six months worth of conversation before you ever get to verse 3. That there is that much there. So I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to talk about what these things mean. And so Genesis 1-1 and most of you, like me, uh, can quote it. It says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And it's so important at every point in the Bible, but especially back here, is don't let your mind read in S's where there's not S's. Let things stand singular instead of plural, unless they are made plural. And so right out of the gate, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We know he created the heavens. So then the question becomes, okay, well, how many heavens are there? Well, Paul defines... Uh, in, I think it's in Corinthians when he talks about, hey, I was a man in the body, out of the body, I do not know, who was caught up into the third heaven. And we can explain uh, the differences essentially real quickly. The third heaven is where the throne of God is. The second heaven is the firmament, stars, moons, that kind of stuff. And the first heaven would be our planet, clouds, that kind of stuff. So just to put that back, we'll revisit that, that there's three heavens. Um, so, But God is here telling us, before we get very far, that in the beginning, God created... Uh, the heaven and the earth, and you're going to find out that what he actually is doing is he is creating his actual abode type of deal. And then he gets into all kinds of philosophical round campfire. What, what was he doing before that? Right? All, yeah. Anyways, so it just we can sit here with s'mores and hot chocolate forever. You know, these are the kind of conversations. But again, before that, he was planning. What translation are you reading that out of? Out of King James Bible. With an S? Earth. Yeah. Okay. Same. Is, is there a what version are you using? NASB. Okay, and ASB? Yeah. Um, ESV. What is it? ESV. Okay, so English Standard and the North American Standard Bible. Okay. NIV. NIV. Also. Yours is with an S? <laughs> okay. So there's going to be those nuances, all right? And so one thing I don't ever try to promote, even though they have value, right, is this idea because what it does is it has a tendency to then all of a sudden have people, I don't have a Greek, I don't have a Latin, I don't have whatever Hebrew and all of a sudden you start putting yourself in a position well if I start breaking this down should it have an S or not have an S what does the original text with Hebrew say this type of stuff what words are they using you can spend a lot of time getting lost in it I'll go look at it type of deal but that's when it goes back to I encourage people to you know research out uh, the Bible that they feel has the closest translation to what you know, God would have said he would have done, which is preserved. And so um, I actually did not look to see if there was an S on that. That's interesting that, that there's going to be a lot of things that we see where there's things that are slightly different. But um, it's not going to be applicable today, but that is interesting that I want to go look and see why other translations, I'll go to the word Hebrew and say, why did they feel it needed an S? And why did the King James translator say, you don't need an S here? And we're going to see this in one of the words that we have today where the word's different too. And so uh, I don't have an answer. I don't even we'll post it, but that's good for me to know because I want to find out. Because sometimes it's a 50-50 where one transfer is like, well, it, as much as it could have had an S, it, it didn't need an S. And they would agree, yeah, it really didn't need it, but we decided to add it. So was it really the, tr the translator saying, we just thought it would make it read better? Okay, well, I'm not really excited about you changing things because you thought I needed help. That's where I kind of draw the lines with translators. When they start telling me that, hey, we did this to make it easier for you, I don't need your help. God wrote it the way that he wrote it. So those would be the things that when I look at it this week, was the translators really trying to make an accurate 
statement that, hey, it really needed the S grammatically. Or a lot of them tend to go, we added it because that's how people read today. I don't know. That starts to you out of where we want to be. But in this particular verse, does it matter? God did create the heavens. Right. And the but he earth. hadn't done the heavens yet. Okay. That, that the, the timing and all this is really going to matter. So, yeah, he, he created the heaven and the earth, and then he's going to go on and he's going to create um, the next heavens within the firmament on the second day. And so, you know, he's chronologically saying, right now I have a heaven. I'm getting ready to make the firmament, which is another heaven. And when you put those together, we now have the heavens. Mm -hmm. To me, it's just being more specific as to how he created things other than blindly just saying, oh, he made the heavens, he made the heavens, because now, for me, it doesn't work grammatically. <laughs> if he made the heavens in chapter 1, verse 1, and he's also making the heavens there, i got a whole lot of heavens going on versus taking a singular and a singular and letting them become the plural. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That may be very nuanced, but did you have a question? Last slide. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. As, as an example, though, I mean, it's the King James is about 1600, so that term, um, they got together and translated it. Yeah, they started thinking of 1604 and put it together by 1611. I mean, if you go and look at the Luther Bible, Luther translated and see. Well, when you go back from there, you can go to the Great Geneva Bible of 1599, you can go back to Tyndale, and when you start working your way through, which is what I usually do, is I look at how some of the older stuff, also again, older doesn't mean right, older just means older. I do look to see at the, the continuation, and it isn't until you get to 1881 with the Revised Standard Version with Westcott and Hort and the things that they did to the manuscript evidence that a lot of the new modern versions come out of, that's where a lot of this stuff went awry with those two guys. So if you want to go read a bunch of uh, uh, what I would call pagan translators, go read up on Westcott and Hort. Um, you know, they were big fans of Darwin, didn't believe in literal creation, this kind of stuff, but yet their writings are what all the new Bibles are based off of. And they don't teach you that on Sunday mornings in life groups. So it's left up to me to give you the opinion on those people. But if you want to find out where your Bible comes from, start with West Hort, um, their new trans, uh, Greek translation in um, uh, uh, 1881, which came into the Revised Standard Version, and then everything comes out of that. And we've defaulted that. Those are the guys to base our stuff off of, and yet their own theology system I would question. You know, like I said, they they loved Darwin, or at least one of them did. I don't remember which one it was, but they thought that he was everything but sliced bread. So but those are good questions, man. See, we didn't even get out of verse one yet. We're never getting anywhere <laughs> they, today. So they, well, let me see New King James has yeah. an F. Yeah. Um, I would argue that the New King James still has left most of the traditions of what was called the Texas Receptus um, closer. But again, like I said, I would want to find out why the translations are adding the S. Was it a lot of them do it because they think they're helping me for the flow of English? And I don't, I don't want people to help me. I want them to stay true to what the Hebrew say. Well, well, if you do it in the Hebrew, it don't make sense when you bring it over to the English. I didn't ask you to make sense. I asked you to write it the way that it was in Hebrew. And so, like I said, a lot of times they think you're doing that they're doing you a favor by doing subtleties by putting S's and colons and apostrophe marks and those kind of things. So. Um, but again, maybe one day this spring we do a textual criticism class. So I'm not trying to jump forward or anything, do it. but reading forward after all this on day two, it states that ours, he called it heaven, not the heavens. Right, because it's another singular. So he's in the firmament creating a heaven. So I'm saying he has it reversed in our, in yeah. our text. It says yeah, so, so, so the question would be then in that, in that translation, is what heavens are being made in the park, and what's the singular heaven being made now? You know, I get my head around a heaven and a heaven making a plural, but to have a plural and a singular, where am I going with this? I have no way to map that. Just the way I read it. So what are the heavens you're talking about? Well, there's three heavens, right? It's the clouds. It's the clouds in the sky would be your, your atmospheric heavens. You know, where the birds fly, your rain, your clouds, that kind of stuff. That 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 would be one of the heavens. Right. Um, the second heaven would be the firmament, sun, star, moon, galaxies, that kind of stuff. And then the third heaven would be God's abode above the what is called the frozen sea, where his throne sits, that kind of stuff. And we can walk you through how we get to that. Paul calls, you know, he says he was caught up into the third heaven, giving us the definition for there being three heavens. I just there something. Well, you know, then it, then it was worth the price of admission. It was worth the price of admission. Well, then, yeah, and we haven't even and we haven't even got into the we haven't even got into the crazy yet. Wow. Uh, all right. Well, let's let's keep going. 
So, um, so question of the week, we did this, right? So we're only going to start quickly. quickly. This is going to go a week or two. Um, is this idea of we're going to deal with this gap issue, right? Um, again, there's people on both sides, smart people. Both would be contentious on why one is so true and one that is not. I would lean into the idea that Evans would just suggest that if you believe into the gap theory, it answers a whole lot more questions than it causes. Not believing the gap theory leaves you a whole lot more. I don't know how to make these things fit. I don't know how to make uh, the dinosaur records fit. I don't know how to let some of these other things fit. Um, and it's not a case because what they'll claim is, well, you're using this as a means to allow for uh, evolution, you know, evolution to fit into creation. And that's not what I'm doing. I believe in a literal uh, creation of the planet. But let's move on here and, and show you where we're at with this. And so one big thing we get to and yours is going to say fill, yours is going to say fill, yours is going to say fill, mine's going to say replenish. And God blessed them and God said unto them in Genesis 1.28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and over the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing uh, that come upon the earth. Um, at first glance, is there a difference between filling something and replenishing something? Yes. Why? why? Why is it a different? Because there's something there for Okay. All right, so this is where it starts us. If, if, if replenish is a word that should be there, then we have a big question on our hand. What are we replenishing if we're, if we're starting before Adam? What are we, and that's, that's a question. What are we replenishing? Life on the planet. Okay, life, that's fair. What life? Well, in this case, human life, but before that, maybe angelic life. I don't know. Okay, well, that's what we're here to maybe find out, okay? Genesis 9 1. The only other time we see this word replenished used in the same way is in a context in which it actually works. Yes? Um, somewhere along the way, I came across a guy that said that replenish is a change in the meaning of the word just within the image itself. It's kind of like let. Let is not allow, let is to restrain. We're, we're going to get into that. I'm, I'm going to address that because that's the first layer of argument of replenish 200 years ago meant fill, not the way we understand it. When we understand replenish today, we think to replenish something or to fill it back up. They'll argue within the last 200 years that replenish never meant that. It, it simply mean to fill. That's all why the translators and all these other Bibles just switched it to fill. But we'll show you um, an argument against that. And so, But in Genesis... <clears throat> Chapter 9, when it goes to Noah, and God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. So only two times do you see the use of that word in that context of life in that kind of thing. And so it is interesting that you get, these are just things I want you to ask yourself, you know, what is God trying to show us that this makes all the sense in the world with Noah, right? He's replenishing the earth after judgment. So we have a pattern. So why is it so hard to believe that Adam wasn't replenishing a planet after judgment. We've already got a pattern for that, right? And so we'll, we'll show you a page for that. If the King James translators wanted to use Phil, they used it dozens of times. Just coming up to Genesis 1, it said that God blessed them, saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters and the seas and let the fowl multiply the earth. So it isn't like they didn't understand that there was a different way they could write it and they were just moving words interchangeably to make life hard. Phil is in there a whole lot more, but they were very detailed in saying, hey, at least here, we're going to use the word replenish, right? And so here's where we're going to make a case to go a little bit, without going too deep, right? We're not trying to create, you know, theology, you know, 400 in here and let you guys work on a doctorate dissertation or anything like that. We're just having fun tonight. You guys go study this out and you can send me some emails about why I should be on the living class. Um, so let's talk about replenish versus fill. And the case for the fact that, yes, within English, but again, you got to remember in 1605, 1604, leading up to 1611, English was very organic. In fact, the King James Bible that I read from is not even a 1611 King James Bible because it was changed from a grammatical standpoint. You know, the double F's and the PH's and the apostrophes, all that stuff was starting to move and shift. And I promise you, if you got a hold of my grades in school, I am nothing even close to an English major. I do know that, right, that English was... An organic language during this time period and it was evolving and so what happens is you actually have a couple three revisions I think this gets us up to like 1769 in which the grammatical stuff is now settled like I said the double F's the P 
pHs, this kind of stuff, the periods of colons, and the way things as we would read them would be correct. Because if you go read a true 1611 Bible, phonically you can see the word because you want to form the sound. And you're like, oh, I see where the letters have changed. It doesn't change the doctrine. It's just changing the way the grammar within English was, was changing. So, yes, to your point, as we went through the last several hundred years, replenish would be had been known or deciphered as a, a filling element. But coming through the 11th, 12th, 13th, 15th centuries, we would have had Latin, we would have had the word repleo, um, and which would be to fill again. And then the Anglo version would be replenir, I believe is the way you pronounce that, which is to fill again. So we're building off of our last 200 years. We gotta remember this is building off the previous two to 400 years that they had. I would argue that there's plenty of evidence to suggest that no, as much as you want to say that replenish means fill in the 17th, 18th century, I won't disagree. When these guys sat down to do a translation, they had access to other languages that say, no, we're not working with a fill. We have a word for fill, right? We're going to use fill. We're going to use replenish. And so you have the Anglo replenir fill again. And so that leads us into Genesis um, 1, 1 through 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. Okay, so then this takes our journey. And so what people would suggest is that right here, there is a gap. And what I mean by a gap is a historical gap in which you have to put the fall of Satan somewhere, right? I don't care where you put it. Yeah. It's got to be before Genesis 3, 1, right? Because in Genesis 3, 1, he shows up as who? Satan. Right, shows up the Satan, Satan, serpent. And so he's already fallen at that point. So back it up, wherever you want, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, pre-Genesis, where do you put the fall of Satan? And if he fell into the third of the angels with him, and God judged that, what did that judgment look like? How did that, did God speak to that? And we're going to look at some cool verses um, that would support uh, that he gave us some information, enough for us to at least be curious, if not give us full answers. So, well, I got a question about that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I, I don't know. That's the reason I'm asking yeah. the question. So, the fall of Satan, I mean, it could have happened before Genesis 1 1, right? <clears throat> or how? Sure. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm, my statement just saying, I think it fell between Genesis 1 1 and 1 2, and so that's the case I'm going to make. So, but could it have happened before Genesis 1 1? Okay. You know, okay. It, it's not an argumentative yeah. thing. It's just, I'm just saying, I've got an opinion on where it lands. Most people. No, he fell. They just don't even have an opinion. They don't know where to put it. Right. I'm just saying, I'm choosing to say, I got a spot for it. That's all I'm saying. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. And here's why. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, right? So he created something incomplete. And the earth was without form and void. So without form, and again, I don't do this very often, but it was needed in this case. You'll find that without form is tohu, and then a void is, it's actually a boohoo, but I just put the boohoo. My wife's like... Is that really right? What is that? Boo hoo! It's, it's it's loose Hebrew, right? It's really bad, right? But what you have is you have confusion, waste, and chaos, emptiness and waste. Well, God tells us throughout uh, in First Corinthians, what is He not the author of? Confusion. Chaos, right? He's not the author of confusion. All right, so there's a little bit of a, a separation there. So if He created the heaven and the earth, why do I now have this chaos? And so if you go to Isaiah 45, 18, again, these little nuggets that God tells you. Say, hey, let me give you a little picture that's going to help you back in Genesis. He says, for thus saith the Lord that created the heavens with an S. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it. He created it not in vain when he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord. There is no else. So, you know, you might just need this little nugget when you're back in Genesis that if you want to understand should there be divisions or not, when I make something, I don't create things in vain. So what am I doing with a world that is without form and void and confused? Well, then that's where the argument says, well, there's evidence within the Hebrew text that there's an implied judgment, that there was something going on, and God judged it. That's why there is the chaos. There, that's why there is the confusion. And so, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And so that's going to be another conversation for next week or the week after that. Because everybody wants to do these bodies of waters and make them planetary, right? That all the deep and all the water is here. 
And you're going to find out that I'm going to show you that the deep has nothing to do with the Pacific Ocean or the Mediterranean. The deep is actually where Leviathan swims in outer space. And again, I know I'm rapidly <laughs> getting you to never come back to this class. Come back. I'll show you all the, all the verses, and you do what you want with the verses, right? But And then God moved upon the face of the water. So was God moving upon the face of the Pacific? Or was God moving upon the face of the waters, which he tells you in the next chapter, is above the firmament and below the firmament? So with God being a universal God, was he limited to moving just across the planet or was he moving across creation? So I'm just challenging you to kind of rethink some of the stuff that maybe someone didn't have um, enough background in to at least oppose these evidences to you and how they may go. So, so understand, I'm trying to keep this simple, that what people say is in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And he created it not in vain according to Isaiah 48, right? Now we have a gap, which I would suggest is where you get Lucifer fall. He judges it. And again, the reason I think the earth got judges when you go to Ezekiel 28, he, he tells um, Lucifer uh, that you were an anointed cherub. And it, it reminds you that he was in Eden, the garden of God. And you go look it up, Ezekiel 28. And so then you're like, what in the same heaven is the devil or Lucifer doing in the garden of Eden? I don't know. That's what Ezekiel 28 says, you know? And so if he was on the planet in a previous Eden and he falls and God judges that, it makes sense. It may not line up with anything we've ever heard, but it all fits biblically. And that's all that matters. It doesn't matter what I say. It just matters if you can take these verses and in context, put them together and say there's a path that this, this might have, have value. And so we'll talk about that more about what actually is the deep. And what is the waters? And again, a lot of the writers, they move in and out of conversations when they use the word sea. In Revelation, sea can mean people groups, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. The deep and waters can actually mean bodies of water on the planet, but it can also mean the waters off the planet. And so then another little verse, again, just out there, a little nugget, you know, kind of riddle me this. With everything we just talked about, a possible gap, and you have, okay, let's say there were angelic beings which Job writes about them. They're called the sons of God, right? Those were the terrestrial beings uh, that worship God. Lucifer led them. Uh, the celestial beings in Job uh, is called, does anyone know? The morning stars, right? So you have the sons of God and the morning stars all described in Job, right? And so now all of a sudden you're going to go read Job and go, there's some cool stuff in this book. I didn't know what these guys meant. And of course, then you take those guys and it's like, well, what are the sons of God doing in Genesis 6, right? And then next thing you know, you're reading your Bible until 3 in the morning and we're all really happened. So <laughs> Jeremiah 4, and so keep in mind, you'll have writers that God inspires them to write about something that's happening on the earth, and then they'll just switch into something prophetic. Go eight, nine verses, and then switch back to the thing that's going on in earth, right? They, he moves in and out of this stuff, and that's where you get some of those doctrinal and historical application, because it's, and you know, that's the case here. So what's happening here is he says, you know, the, the nations are divided, you know, between the, the, the ten uh, tribes and the two of the south, this kind of stuff. And then, uh, but Jeremiah, you know, he's a prophet. He's like all the prophets, you know, saying, Israel, you've messed up again, type of deal. He says, How long shall I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? For my people is foolish, they have not known me. They are sottish children, which is just drunken children, is what he's saying with sottish. And they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. Period. And now he's going to change his thought and go off onto something. What does that ever have to do with what he's just talking about, the historical judgment of Israel? And when you get past this passage, he then goes into a group of passages that speaks to the tribulation period. So he's judging Israel historically. He's going to talk about something that happened in eternity past, and then he's going to move into something that hasn't even happened yet. And that's why these things can be sometimes confusing until you can break these apart. So if we know he's talking about Israel historically, he gets to the knowledge and he changes. Now read with me what he says here. He says, and again, a lot of you may or may not even know that this was here. He says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Well, that's not the situation of the planet when Israel was on the planet. We just talked about there being people and disobedience and judgment. Well, now we're talking about a world that's like Genesis 1-1, where it's void and form. Okay, so that's where we start going about, what's this chapter doing in this book? And you got to start asking these questions. But this is really cool. It says, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. And I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. 
I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. I would argue that this was Eden where Lucifer was. And all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord. All right. So if I have no man, why do I have cities? Why do we have, you know, ongoing conversations about places like Atlantis and the Greek mythologies and all those things that I would argue are more truth than fable uh, because that's how they were passed down out of, out after the Tower of Babel. Um, that they, they, they hold a lot more truth than you would suppose. But so, so yeah, riddle me this. Yeah. How do I have no manning that I have cities that are broken down in a world that is without form and void and has no light? What in the world am I reading here? I'm reading Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Genesis 2, judgment. And the earth was void and without form, right? And God moved upon the face of the earth. Uh, the earth. And so, again, we see a pattern here just randomly out here in Jeremiah saying, hey, there's, there's more going on there to support the idea that I had to judge Satan. I'm not going to tell you everything about the judgment, but I'm going to give you enough to understand what happened and where it happened. And so why, we see it very you, clear. Why do you think that he went from that to this uh, why he moves around yeah it happens all the time you you see it in like well you see it in isaiah 4 and you see it in yeah. ezekiel 28 he's talking about what is it uh the prince of tyre or whatever and how evil he was a lot of times he'll talk about uh the pharaoh of egypt and then all of a sudden he's making a bunch of spiritual applications and he switches into describing satan he's no longer talking about the man he's talking about the spirit that's behind the man and it's just why and how God moves within his thinking. Why he moves in and out of changing direct. Because again, you get out of this and he flips it into prophetic stuff about the Jews and what will happen to them in the tribulation. So this part was a reflection. Of Genesis 1-2. Yeah. So, I'm just asking a question. <laughs> so chapters and verses are not, I mean, so the question I got is, is chapters and verses were kind of put in after the fact, right? I mean, that wasn't a part of the original manuscript, is that? That's correct. Okay, so I mean, in some ways, I'd look at that like, man, you should have put a chapter like right there in 23 <laughs> and started it. Right, but... But it's clear with the yeah. context that... But we also know be. that I believe God's going to do exactly with his word <laughs> the way he wants to. And even though we may say man came through and he put chapters and verses the way he wants, some of the way the chapters line up... Um, are beyond man's ability to recreate those things. You know, like Job having 42 chapters and being a picture of Israel and tribulation, and yet the tribulation period has 42 months. And, you know, Revelation 13 just happens to have the man of sin. And you go on and right, on and right. on with, yeah, man put it, but I think God was supernaturally a part of um, everything. Oh. Yeah. And then what's crazy is we, we can believe the miracles of the Bible. But we stop short of believing the miracle of the Bible. Does that make sense? Yeah. That, oh, God could never, this is the only way he talks to us. You think he's going to let man get in there and disrupt that? <laughs> so if you're going to buy into a virgin birth with some baby on the backside of the hill, with following some star and then raising people from the dead, which is way crazier than maybe God judging an angelic being, you know, if you're going to, just, you heard that more, right? So I got two minutes. I want to try to get through a couple things here real quick. So what this looks like is this. Genesis 1-1, you have a creation. He created, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He places the sons of God. He places Lucifer, the anointed cherub that covers. It says that he was made up of musical instruments, and uh, he was made up of stones, and God's light passed through him, and worship was given back to him from, I would argue, according to Ezekiel 28, he was in the garden of God, Eden, from the planet, Worshiping, Pride comes into his life. God judges it, Genesis 1-2. The earth is void and without form, right? And now we actually get a recreation in Genesis 1-3 through 2-3. And then in, and again, the pattern's already set. One, we know that God always shows himself in threes because he's a triune being. He does it the same here uh, through creation and recreation. And when he goes to judge the planet again, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from the face of the earth, 
uh, and the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. Uh, so we know that he's going to wipe away the heavens <coughs> and the earth. And so this is actually a really weird thought. People just assume the planet's going to be there and God's going to come uh, in the millennial he'll judge. But at the end when he wipes the planets and the universe away, the idea suggests that you're going to have a whole lot of souls just floating in emptiness before the throne of God being judged. Because he's, he's wiped it all away. There is nothing to stand there. It's just you're floating there. And so 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall me melt with fervent heat. And the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So we know a judgment's going to come. So the idea that he's going to completely judge the planet and completely wipe it out and do it again, we, we fully know that. We, in fact, we talk to our neighbors about, yeah, I can't wait till God remakes the new heaven and the new earth. Well, why is it so strange to think that he did that in the, in the past with the angelic beings? Oh, that's preposterous. I've never heard anyone say that. I don't know. God's a God of pattern, so I mean, you don't have to agree with me. I'm just saying there's a lot of evidence to say if the angels fell, he judged it, did Adam and Eve, started over. He was a son of God, created worship, and he's going to start over again with the new heaven and the new earth. And then obviously Revelation 21.1, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now you can argue, does that mean there's no more oceans on the planet? Or are there no more oceans in the universe? Because he already told us that there's oceans in the universe. They're just frozen. So, you know, we can talk about that doesn't matter so much, but, you know, we can have that conversation. So, um, I feel like people are going to go home like, I don't know I was ready for that class. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's okay. Like I said, this is stuff that, um, these are questions that are out there. This is probably a little deeper than most of the questions. Uh, you know, a lot of the Bible questions are, is my dog going to be in heaven with me? Right? You know, the yeah. rainbow bridge, right? Uh, I don't know that we get to that one. Right. Uh, short answer? No. Sorry. Uh, no rainbow <laughs> bridge. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's a good question because, again, it has been theologically studied. And when you go back there and you actually let the Bible be the Bible and you read it and you understand, holy smokes, the Bible's deeper than I ever can imagine. And so now Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 is not that deep. <laughs> Genesis 1, 1 to Revelation 22 is that deep. And now it creates that hunger that David talked about. It's like, man, I just want to eat this word up because it's so interesting. It's consuming me. And Lord, it's just, you're so amazing. And so hopefully, like I said, this wasn't meant to be anything other than uh, um, some answers for the people that asked the question, some fun and some exposures to, to some theological concepts that exist. I would argue that probably... Uh, this would be in the minority because uh, a lot of the people that want to deal with this don't have the background to deal with it. Not that I'm anything, right? I just have the fun of taking the time to study uh, and have spent some time going, okay, then answer the questions. Well, I don't know that I got the answers. Okay, well, then don't talk to me about it. You know, just don't tell me I'm wrong. Show me from the Bible why I'm wrong. So 30-ish, uh, 730-ish. I'm so good at that. <laughs> Let me pray so I get the parents out of here and then I'll answer your question. All right. All right. Lord, thanks again so much. And uh, Father, I just uh, pray that you take your word uh, and just let it be truth, no matter what that truth is. Um, I don't want to confuse or confound anybody for the sake of just creating confusion. But Lord, um, I want to expose the depths of who you are and how powerful and just awesome you are. So Lord, I just pray that tonight and the rest of the nights that we do this will be uh, revealed to the glory of your son. And we love you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.